Well, good morning, and it is a real joy and an honor to be able to come to you today and to share God's word. Uh, we are starting to enjoy uh, a lot of life here and getting to know many of you and uh, really, really, you know, full of joy and gratitude how you've received us, how you've, you know, not reserved yourself and just been around us and uh, made us feel comfortable in this country. So looking forward to meeting each of you personally and to get to know your stories, to hear what God is doing in your life. I like to say that everyone who has been created of God is, has a story, and I believe we need to hear each one's story and just to see what God is writing through all our lives. So really looking forward to hugging and one day when that is allowed <laughs> <laughs> and just getting to hear your stories and how God has been good to you. Over this season of the summer, we are carrying on the series, which is from the book of Psalm and, and chapter 23, he restores my soul. And I think all of us over the season of the pandemic have something that has been an enemy or has chipped into our soul and chipped away, uh, you know, into our soul and just made our soul weaker or something that we don't desire. We, when you look at ourselves, some, somehow we don't feel like I am complete, I am restored, I am whole the way I should be. And we want to talk about this morning just how the Word of God has the ability and the power to bring back, to bring us back, to get us to shape, to bring us back to wholeness, the wholeness of the soul. So allow me to ask you a question this morning, and I don't want you to rush. I want you to pause and think about this question. You see, we're not in a hurry to finish this sermon. I mean, uh, the director said I can go <clears throat> for about as, as long as I want. So anyway, I'm kidding. <laughs> But this is the question this morning. What is the most valuable thing that you possess? And I say, don't be in a hurry. Think about it, because sometimes we really are in a hurry. We don't think about what, it, what exactly do I value? What's the most valuable thing that you possess? Now, I know some friends of mine they, they really value their garden. They value the summer when, you know, the flowers can come, you know, that moment when they pop out uh, in the spring. Some people love their pets, like they have a crazy value for their pets. Uh, <laughs> some people value their cars. Like they just want to come out and see that it's still there. It's clean all the time. You know, the tires are, you know, the, the latest tires. I don't know what you value. Some people value their phones. Like they wouldn't let it off their site. So they were like, whoa, where is my phone? You know, <laughs> is there a text message? And some people love the heirlooms that have been passed down to them. You know, this was given to me by my grandmother, my grandfather, and they hung so dearly to those things. But this morning, the question is to you, what is the most valuable thing in your life? And while you think about that, I want to jump into what Jesus put as the most valuable thing. And he mentioned it in this statement. Mark chapter 8, verse 36 to 37. Jesus uses the business language. And he says this, for what shall it profit? Some of you understand the word profit. Profit and loss in business. <laughs> What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So the words that are used here, profit, gain, lose, and soul, as if to replace the word gain in that sense of profit with the word soul. Jesus places the soul as the highest, most valuable thing that you possess. And he says, this is the one thing that you can exchange for. Some people think you should exchange for the world and the soul. So when you place the world and the soul, if your value is the world, Jesus says, I value the soul. If you chase the world, 
you, this is what you're going to lose, the soul. The question is, what is the soul? Because then there's all understandings around, you know, the body has three, maybe it's made, a human being is made of three, maybe the soul, the body, and the spirit. But then what is the soul? And how does it come apart? You know, when you think about the soul, how does it come apart? And how then do we put it together? And over this series, you've had sermons about the soul, but I wanted to lock in on this. How do we restore the soul? And we're going to talk about many other practices that you can engage in that help you to restore the soul. So what is the soul? How does it come apart? And how does God put it back together? The soul is the hidden or the spiritual side of the person. This is Dallas Willard trying to explain what the soul is. The soul is the hidden or the spiritual side of a person, and it includes their individual thoughts, their feelings, along with their heart and will, with its intents and choices. So let's break it down. What is a soul? It, is, it comprises the will or the heart of the person, the will being the, the choices and the freedoms that we have, the center Uh, from which we say yes and no. That is our will. It comprises the mind where we think, where we feel the thoughts and the desires that we have. It's the emotional center of what we think and feel. It comprises the body, surprisingly. What we do, our actions, that are informed by our feelings. So when we feel We want to act upon our feelings. So the body is part of the soul. And surprisingly, it comprises our relationships. And that's what COVID came to interfere with. It just chipped away on that side of our soul, our relationship. All of a sudden, I don't want to meet you. Not because I don't love you. Because I love you. Because I want you to be safe. But in the process of showing love to you, I also get away from company. And that thing that really fuels me is taken away from me. Our relationships. What we do with the people around us is part of our soul. So Dallas Wheeler says, uh, the integration of these things, the four things I've talked about, coming together for the purpose of loving God and loving your neighbor makes up the soul. I want to say that again because it's very important. The integration of the will, the mind, the body, and our relationships coming together for the sole purpose of loving God and loving our neighbors makes up the soul. So let's go down because then we, we want to understand like, hey, God, I need you to restore my soul. So how does it look like when I am in that place of wholeness and my soul is restored? How does it look like when my heart, my mind, my body, and my relationships are whole and what God wants us to be? And this is how Jesus would answer that question. He would say, love the Lord your God with all your heart. With all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. As the picture of a whole and complete soul or a healthy soul is when we are in a place where with my mind, my heart, my body, and the people around me, I can say that I truly love God and I love the people around me. So question number two, how then does the word of God, because we are talking about today, Psalm 23 verses 3, the Bible says, he leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul. One of the practices, which is the practice of reading God's word, studying God's word, meditating on God's word. I like how, uh, I think it's Ian or Jody who said, devouring or was it like eating the word of God? You know? 
Yeah. How does that fuel my soul and restore my soul? And that's what we want to look at. It. Psalm, 119, uh, Psalm 19 verses 7. Psalm 19 verses 7. The Bible says, the law or the word of the Lord is perfect. Refreshing or restoring the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making the wise simple. We had a Bible study with my daughters and my wife, and we're looking at that verse. And uh, when my daughters, you know, we're trying to explain to them who a simple person is, <laughs> they're just like, it doesn't make sense. When somebody is simple, it's supposed to be a cool thing. But in the Bible, it's not a cool thing. Like when you say, oh, it makes the wise, it makes wise the simple. So like, okay, the Bible for simple is mm, an easy way to say it's a fool, you know. <laughs> so the word of God has a way of taking this foolish person and making him wise. Restoring the soul. This is what it means to restore. It's to give the soul its worth. Mm -hmm. If you remember the hymn, a Christmas hymn has these lines on it. And the souls felt its worth. Mm -hmm. There's a line on one of the Christian uh, in Christmas carols. It talks about the soul felt, felt its worth. Mm -hmm. And that's what the word of God comes to do for my soul. It comes to give my soul its worth, its value. It's example of home, you know, home makeovers or car makeovers. You, you've watched those shows like they take this junk and they turn it into this amazing, I want to buy it. <laughs> and I wanted to pause at this moment because as I prayed about it, I thought about this car. You know, you probably have that slide up and, and look at that car, you know, the worn out, broken down. And when you look at that car, it's like, I do not want to be associated with that car in my garage. <laughs> like, that's not my car. Oh, you know, I want to say it's my uncle's or someone. who I kept it for someone. Yeah. But I want to be associated with the picture on the right because it says, hey, value, look at that. It's vintage. It has value. I could sell it and be a very rich person. Think about your soul. What is it that when you look at that picture, it says, and I really want to be like the car on the right. Mm -hmm. A restoration of my soul. I want to feel alive again over the summer. I want to be alive in my mind, in my heart, in my body, in my relationships. I want to come alive again. Right. I don't want to be like someone hidden in, in, in you know, like in the caves, hoping that someday light will shine and we'll be able to come out of this place. I want to be full of the life that God gives. And there's a way in which God wants to help us today. It's through his word. One of the ways he, he's going to do this is through his word. The Bible talks about different states of the soul. It says about my soul longs as if it's Oh, God, I wish I could get to that point. You know, it's like somebody who walks a long distance and he's looking for water. So there's this deep longing. I wish I could find some water to drink. And then he talks about my soul thirsts. And he uses words like my soul yearns. But also it caught my attention because it uses words like my soul is wounded. Because some of us are yearning for something. Our soul is like, I wish I could get it. But some of us, our soul is wounded. In fact, there's a scripture that says, the spirit of a man, you can, you know, replace the word spirit with the soul. It's the spirit of a man can sustain him in sickness. But a wounded soul or spirit, who can bear? Because for some of you watching me this morning, you are in a place of wounds. You are wounded in your soul. And God wants to give you that healing and restoration of your soul. The writer of the Proverbs also placed the soul at a very high level. He said, 
Watch over your heart, which you could also replace with the soul. Watch over your heart with all diligence. For from it flows the springs of life. So when Jesus is talking about losing your soul, of course, there's a fast reaction to it. Could it be that he talks about death and losing your soul eventually? I mean, there's a possibility, and we could actually rush to that interpretation and say, Jesus was talking about losing your life. And well and good if that's what it means. But I want to come to you humbly and say, this is possibly what he's talking about. He, he's not talking about the direction of your soul. He's talking about the condition of your soul. Losing our soul. So that's why he talks about this. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and the condition of their soul is a waste. It's something. That's why people live in four walls and they have everything that you possibly think they should have, but they just don't have life. Yeah. Yeah. They're just like, oh my God, I, I wish I could get something more than this. I mean, I've heard of celebrities with all that we think that's when you have made it in life. And they just feel like, I don't care. I don't care. And I think that's a statement of the soul's worth. Like my soul is wasted. I don't care about what I have around me. I care so much about my heart, my mind. I care about my strength. I care about the relationships. And when that's taken away from you, the relationships, the stability of the heart, the mind, and the body, what are you going to do? So this morning, would you fight for your soul? And for those of you who are at a place of longing and yearning, would you care for the soul? Because the soul is the center of all we experience on earth. And you have a soul. You have a soul. You have the responsibility to take care of that soul. So, four things that the soul faces. One, your soul has an enemy. In fact, Peter says it, First Peter 2.11 says, Abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. So the soul is, is hit hard when we walk against the will of God. The soul is fought as an enemy. Sin will always go after your heart, your mind, your body, and your relationships. And that's why the writer of the Psalms in Psalm 119, 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Speaking of the remedy for the enemy of the soul, which is sin, it's the word of God. It's the word of God. So over this summer, what will be my practice when it comes to reading God's word? How much of the word will I take in meditatively? Asking God to help me understand his word. Number two, your soul can be discouraged. Or as David said, why so downcast my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? And if you're in that place, I want you to understand. He says, put your hope in God. That's, that's how you restore the soul when you're so disturbed. Like, hey, my hope is in the Lord. Number three, your soul can be burdened or weighed down. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 29. It says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls will find rest for the soul. Number four, the soul 
can exhibit fear for the future. And that's, that's so real in our, in our context of, of the pandemic. That we, like, what about the future? What about the people that have lost their jobs? And what about the jobs that will never come back again? You know, like companies are hard to close. So there's this fear that crept people. I remember when, when, when COVID came up, we, were, we just had, uh, landed in the U.S. and it just became a big issue. And a lot of companies were going into... Uh, <clears throat> hard time, they were laying off their stuff. And the first thing you could tell is just people started to think about the future and the soul felt attacked because like, hey, I, I do not know about the future, so I will try and keep myself safe. Mm-hmm. And so when the soul goes into this state of, of fearing the future, the Bible says this in Hebrews 6 verse 19, it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And that hope, by the way, comes through our understanding of God's will and God's promises in the word of God. So for you to restore that part of your soul is lock into the word of God and just hear what the Lord is saying about your future. He says, I alone know the plans that I have for you. They are plans for good and not evil, plans to give you a hope and a future. God's word carries the future plan for your life. So how does the soul, how do we put back the soul? I have a few suggestions for you from the word of God. The word of God, among other practices, can help us get soul restoration. Listen to the word, listen to this. Number one. The word of God has living power. Like the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 12, 13, the word of God is living and active. So the word of God is a living thing. It's so so amazing when I think about it. The word of God is not just let, you know, uh, characters written down on a piece of paper. It is living and active. In fact, uh, uh, Jesus speaking in the book of John chapter 6 says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. That's how powerful the words of God are. So when I come to the word of God, I remind myself that, hey, this is not just another novel or something written by some guys who I do not know. It is living and it is active. See, friends, if I needed to walk a mile from where I stand so that I could get something that sustains my body, which is food, I would do it every day because I need it. If I neglect it, I will go into a state of my body will start crashing and I'll lose my body at some point. But if I neglect it, that's my fault. If I lack it, that's another thing. Like if I was in a place where there's no food, well, I don't have food. There's nothing I can do about it. But if I neglect going to pick what I need for my sustainers, that's my fault. And I want you to move away from a place of neglecting the word of God because that's what will kill your soul. Like come to the place and say, I will pick the word of God. I will listen to the word of God. I do that a lot. I listen to it when I cannot read it. I just plug it in my ear. Now listen to it. And we've taught our children a practice. We read the word of God. We listen to it together. And we say sometimes, even when you're bored, flat out bored to listen to the word of God, we tell them your subconscious is registering the word. And there's a day when you will need it and God will bring it out. And that's what the children when, I, when a Hebrew child was born, the first words they would hear the parents say were the words of God. Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And then would read the Torah to them. How can a toddler understand the word of God? We don't know, but we know that there's a subconscious that registers every word that is spoken to a child. How does a child learn to speak? Because we talk to them. Even when they look at us like, oh, I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> But we speak the words to them. Friends, I want to encourage you, take the word of God. 
When it's boring, plug it in your car, listen to it. Like just soak in the word of God. And God has a way of using that to just restore the soul. The word of God is a mirror. Thank God for the house we live in. My wife says it has so many mirrors. (laughs) It will keep us from leaving the house in good time. (laughs) The word of God has the ability to show us who we really are and what God wants us to be. So the word of God holds the picture of what we should be. And when we come to it and look at our surfaces, oh my God, that's not what I am. I need to change that. It brings us to the place of changing the things we should change and strengthening the things we should strengthen. James 1, 23 and 24 says, I don't know if you have it up there, but it talks about coming to the word of God. It says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently into his face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and once forgets what he, he, he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being not hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So when we come to the word of God, it's like, this is who I am. And this is what God really wants me to be. And he says, please do not forget that. Don't walk away from the word of God like, Yeah, the word of God says, do this, but like, I will not do it. You're like a man who looks at himself and says, I forgot how I look like. Mm -hmm. Number three, the word of God is food to the soul. I like this. Jesus, when he was fasting, he was asked this, you know, uh, he was tempted. And he says, in Matthew 4, 4, he says, man shall not live by bread alone. Let's just stop there, guys. Let's stop there. Because this is so common, where all I live for is bread alone. Mm. I'm talking about food. Every day I wake up, it's, all right, my, my fridge is full of what I need. When you look at your fridge and it's full of everything you need, you should pause and say, man shall not live by bread alone. In fact, you should have this on top of your fridge. (laughs) Man shall not live by bread alone. And there's something else that should be besides you. It's the word of God. But by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's when it's complete. Not when my fridge is full, but when my fridge, yes, is full. Thank God for provision. And I have the word of God in me. So... This is what you do when you come to the word of God. You read it. You study it. There's so many apps that can help you today with the Bible app. Amazing, you know, studies in there that you can read. Devotions that you can benefit from. But don't stop there. Believe the word of God. And then obey the word of God. Because a lot of people just say, I believe that's it. But they don't obey the word of God. Don't be like a guy who looks at himself in the mirror and then all of a sudden, I forgot how I look like. The Bible talks about obey, obey the word of God and let the word of God change your life. Let the word of God change you to who God wants you to be. The Apostle John, writing about the importance of the soul, he says in 3 John, uh, uh, 3 John chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you. This is my prayer for you this summer. Dear friends, I pray that you enjoy good health and that it may go well with you even as your soul is getting Along well. That's what John is, is aiming at. He says, hey, if you get the soul going well, I pray every other part of your life will be well. The heart, loving God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your will, 
with all your strength and then loving your neighbor as yourself. Coming to the word of God and allowing the word of God to help you in every one of those places to be complete and to love well. I want to pray for you this morning as the band I will be just playing and singing along and I ask you right you know where you're seated or where you are to pause for a moment and say God shine your light on my soul and then show me just how I'm doing in my soul show me the things I've valued over the soul or the things that I have valued at the expense of my soul. Show me how to come to the word of God and how to get a restoration. And then just use these words. I like to say, God, I humble myself before you. As I, I can see, you know more than I know. And I know that you know more than I do. And that's why I need your help. I need you to take my soul and restore me. I'm praying for the condition of my soul where I am wounded that I would be healed, where I'm exhausted and burdened that I will get rest again. I'm praying for the condition of my soul that I'll be healthy, I'll be strengthened by you, O oh God. I'm praying that I will eat your word and it will become great in my soul. It will revive me. So open my eyes like David said that I may behold wonderful things in your law. Open my ears that I may hear your words and obey them. And so I pray for those who are watching at home and those of us who are here. Oh, Father, you would give us a restoration. Let your spirit right now move into every home, every room, every person watching. May they experience the love of Jesus and the power of Jesus. We thank you this morning. We thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen.